Thanks so much for joining us here on 9 News Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi here with Kyle Clark. And Kyle, last night, it's, by the way, we're recording this on Friday, February the 17th. You were, uh, did the uh, help moderate the first of the three mayoral debates that we're going to have yep. televised here on 9 News. Yep. Um, start things off with your top line takeaways from the debate. Well, there were a lot of them there. Mm. Uh, it, was, so it was 13 people. It was two hours commercial free. And I, w I actually came away really impressed just as somebody who is a Denver voter myself. Uh, in terms of how substantive the conversation was between the candidates, they had real disagreements with each other, but they were able to express that respectfully. One thing that's pretty unique about this race is that they agree on what the big problems are. Because there's no incumbent in the race, there's nobody trying to defend the status quo. So they agree on the problems, they agree the status quo is not acceptable, and that's great because then we can talk about solutions. And the debate was able to focus on what they see as the solutions for homelessness, crime and public safety, and affordability within the city. So a sub substantive debate overall, right? Yeah, I mean, there, I didn't see ad hominem attacks. Uh, there are very few things that jumped up as uh, fact checks in the moment. There are a few claims where it appeared to be based more on confusion than somebody trying to make a false claim. Uh, we're going to take apart a couple of the claims that, uh, upon a second look, need some more scrutiny. But I think, for the most part, people stuck to the facts. They stuck to the issues at hand. And there were even instances where people talked about how they disagreed with their friends up there. I mean, at one point, there were hmm. people talking about how they were disappointed in one another. You know, when I mean, you get that dropped on you, that's always, that's always bad when they say they're disappointed in you. But if people think that just because, you know, Denver is a lefty city, that everybody who's running for mayor has the same set of lefty ideological beliefs, that's not what we saw on stage last night. You saw, you saw a real gamut of ideological beliefs about how to handle issues like homelessness and about crime. And if you didn't know the political persuasion of the people up there, I bet you you would have probably thought that five of the 13 were Republicans or conservatives. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. So we're going to get into that. And it sounds like homelessness in particular is one of the key points of some of that substantive mm -hmm. debate. Uh, can you get into some of that and what were some of those points of disagreement? Sure. So um, one, of the, one of the things that we talked about is... What's working, what's, what's going on now is not working to clear encampments. Okay, we have an urban camping ban, but most people are not getting ticketed for it. Very few people are getting arrested for it. It's being used by the Hancock administration as a move along policy. Move along, we take down the tents. People set up down the street. Move along, we take down the tents. It's just kind of chase people around the city. Some people go into services, some people go into uh, detox or mental health treatment, but a lot of people are just chased around. So the question is, what are we going to do differently? And, and are you willing to arrest your way out of the problem? Can you arrest your way out of the problem? Some of the folks up on that stage thought that you can do that. I mean, Trinidad Rodriguez is talking about uh, taking people involuntarily to like a field hospital type setup. Uh, Kelly Bruff, former head of the Denver Chamber of Commerce, one of the front runners in the race, she had never really explained when push comes to chub, you're going to start arresting people just for disobeying your order to go to shelter or go mm. to treatment? And she said, yes, we'll arrest for the urban camping ban. So to hear that from Trinidad Rodriguez, to hear that from Kelly Bruff, uh, Thomas Wolf is running a single-issue campaign and the encampments. He would round people up and arrest them as well. Uh, Chris Hansen would uh, arrest people as well. Uh, Kwame Spearman is talking about doing the same thing. These, these are folks who are, would take a much, whether you want to call it heavy-handed or strict approach, to enforcing the camping ban, whereas you had other folks up there on the stage like... Dr. Lisa Calderon, uh, Ian Tafoya, who are saying arrests are not going to get us anywhere. It's just going to perpetuate a bad cycle. And they want to see uh, a, a different approach to handling homeless encampments, more outreach than what the city is doing now, less of the move along type stuff. And then you've got some folks who kind of fall toward the middle of the spectrum, like your Mike Johnson's, who wants to create a bunch of tiny home villages uh, to move people in so they could be moved as units, like in family units, uh, friend groups, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, again, there's 13 people up there. There's 13 plans. I don't have them all in my head. But you get the sense that it really runs the gamut of people who would do very hard line enforcement to clear the streets and people who would say that what we're doing right now is too hard line and it's exacerbating the problem. Another one of the big issues is debate was crime, and it kind of ended up centering on one of the candidates, uh, Chris Hansen's uh, television ad, with that being a big firing point, wasn't it? Yeah, it was... It was 
clearly one of the moments that people remember from the debate, because when you look about what people were talking about afterwards on social media and so forth, this is what a lot of people were talking about, which is Chris Hansen is the first candidate in the race to get on TV with an ad. His first ad is promising a crackdown on crime and homelessness. He's kind of one of the more hardliners in the race on those issues. The ad opens with shots of people who appear to be homeless committing, committing crimes or living on the street. Seven out of the eight people are people of color. It's pretty striking when you see the ad. It, it, jump, it jumps out at you. And we just asked him last night, can you tell us why you made that choice? And he appeared completely flummoxed that anybody would think that that was an mm. issue. Very quickly, the other candidates in the race explained to him why it's an issue. Raise your hand here on the stage if you're disgusted by an ad that makes people of color as the only criminals or the people who are overrepresented in homelessness. It is a trope that has been broken forever. There's a reason why people have PhDs in this writing books about it. I cannot believe that he would make this ad. I am so disappointed in you. We've worked on things together. When I saw the ad, I, I called a lot of people. And guess what? They agree with us. I hope that you will denounce it and take it away. Thank you, Ian. Chris Hansen. I, look, I think... I think that's fine. I've, I took actual footage from around town. It is not just people of color that are featured in this ad. I think this is, a, this is a really kind of shocking that it suddenly becomes this conversation about the, the, the way that we took footage. This is the number one issue on voters' minds. How do we improve public safety? How do we address the homelessness crisis? To, to have some accusation that somehow a, a racist ad, I think, is totally overwrought. Kyle. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, Leslie Aird. I gotta agree with Ian here, and as a woman of color, as a black woman, it's really interesting to me to have someone on the stage like ignore the fact that people of color are asking you to take that ad down. It is offensive and it's scary for our communities. But I wanna be clear, you didn't see what we saw because you're not us. Yep. But you've gotta put those blinders away. You've gotta have more people looking at your ads and in your administration that look like the communities you're serving. It was offensive, Chris, and as a friend of mine, I'm disappointed too. Ian Tafoya, who is Latino and Native, was talking about how personally he was offended by the ad and how there's a different way to get the message across. Tafoya then surveyed the other candidates. He didn't ask her permission to do this. Surveyed the other candidates for a hand raise for who thought the ad should come down, be replaced by something else, and every hand went up. Leslie Harrod then got in there and said, these types of stereotypes, she, I, I think she said, put my community in danger. And she said, this is what happens when you don't have people of color on your staff who can tell you, hey, it's a bad look. You're saying something when you do that. And then you had Kwame Spearman jump in and say, Chris Hansen likes to talk about his analytical mind as an engineer, that you got to have the stats on your side if you're going to do that kind of thing. And it was, it was mm. a pretty tough moment. And I think what was most striking about it to me was not necessarily the unanimity of the other candidates and saying this is a problem, but Hansen not appearing to have any idea why anybody would think that Basically, fear-mongering with images of people of color is a problem. Do you think that Hansen did enough, or he got enough attacks here that it could, in vote, some voters' eyes, or quite a few voters' eyes, disqualify him from being a candidate? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's I hard know. to get a sense at it, this point. It is hard, it is hard to Two get more a sense. It is hard to get a sense. Um, I mean, he still is He's facing an open call, as of the time that we're talking right now, to, to change the ad or to take it down from people on the stage who, when they made the call, said, you are my friend. <laughs> And I'm asking you not to do this. I think it was Leslie Harrod, right? Who's that? I, I, think, I think both Leslie Harrod and I think perhaps Ian Tafoya both mentioned their friendship with Chris Hansen and, and said, like, I'm, I'm a friend and I'm disappointed in you. I'm, I'm a friend and I, I'd like you to take this down. So now it's kind of a broader conversation about how does he handle uh, a crisis? How does he handle a challenge? How does he handle an issue? Does he handle it by just kind of steamrolling ahead? Does he change course in some way? And that is yet to be seen. Hmm. I guess when it comes to Hanson perhaps putting himself in maybe some danger here, were there any candidates that you think really elevated themselves with their performance? Well, I Again, think... hard to say. But... It is hard to say. It's, thir it's, 13, mm -hmm. it's 13 people up there. There's some people up there that going in you knew were really good debaters, and they were really good debaters last night. Okay, that's your Mike Johnson, that's your Leslie Harrod, that's your Lisa Calderon. They've been in a bunch of debates before. They're very good at it. They're highly skilled in that format. Then there were some people that we haven't seen in debates, so you kind of wondered, oh, how's this going to go for them? Uh, Kelly Bruff, she's been around politics forever. This is her first run for elected office. She was fairly restrained in the debate. 
I don't think she looked to insert herself more than once or twice. Hmm. And when I asked her questions, she was pretty plain spoken in, in giving straight answers. She gave a she gave a very heartfelt answer about why she's skeptical of supervised injection sites after she lost her husband to addiction. Uh, I spent my entire life uh, loving someone who struggled with an addiction, and I know how hard it is to figure out how you love and support someone but not enable a behavior that's destroying them and your family. And I think for me, I struggle with the enabling piece and trying to draw that line. And I think it's a fair conversation for a community to have, uh, not to fight about it, but to recognize this is really hard. And I think that was a moment where she really captured the attention of the room. There was another moment when I asked her as the former head of the chamber, are there any times when the interests of business diverge from the interests of citizens? And could she come up with an example of something that she advocated for for business that she now doesn't think is a great idea for everybody? And she said that she couldn't think of something. It was pretty striking to hear somebody say, like, what's good for business is good for people. Um, but not totally unsurprising that somebody who's the head of the chamber might say that. Kwame Spearman is somebody else who hasn't been in a debate. CEO of the Tired Cover Bookstore. Another one who's running as a hardliner on, on homelessness and on crime. I thought he did a pretty good job in the debate last night, too, because he was very active. Uh, he was very plain-spoken in what he wants to do. He was very direct. Uh, he also, based on our post-debate analysis, now that we may go through it, dropped one of the most enormous whoppers in the debate when he said that there was a study by Homeless Out Loud that showed that most of the people surveyed living on the streets did not want housing. And that's his thing, that they're taking advantage of the system, they want to live in encampments, they don't want to live in houses. He cited Denver Homeless Out Loud's study that he claims says this. Denver Homeless Out Loud, which is a far more progressive organization than I am, did a survey and said 52% of our unhoused would prefer to live in a tent than other housing options. They also said that 18% of our unhoused will only live in tents. You know, Kyle, if you think about what we have to pay <coughs> our workers right now and what that means to live in the city, the transportation ecosystem that we've got in our city, you can start understanding why people are making decisions that put them in a situation where they're not housed right now. We've got to have a holistic approach to having affordable housing, to having good paying jobs, but we've also got to have laws that are enforced that deter people from living a life where they're unhoused. Denver Homeless Out Loud is like, no, read the study. That's not what the study says. The graph that Spearman is providing, he's reading it correctly. It's a ranked choice. He's reading incorrectly. Uh, something like like 91 respondents said that they wanted to live in a house, and 18 said a tent. So I think he's just I think he's just reading the numbers upside down. And in the moment, give her credit, Lisa Calderon said, "If you were in my class, she she teaches. She goes, if you were in my class, I'd give you an F because you do not understand that that poll, that survey. And now after going through it and l reviewing it afterwards, it appears that she's right." He's wrong. And that kind of central core claim that he's basing his campaign around, that people on the streets want to be on the streets, he better find something else to back it up with because the stool just got yanked out from under him. Mm. I guess, Colin, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Yeah. Do we have a good idea or a general idea about where the average Denver voter falls in line with, with those two key issues with, with crime, with homelessness? Where do you think the median voter is roughly on that? We know that, uh, we know that the voters of Denver hold those up as the two big issues. Now, do we have solid polling yet or solid research yet on which solutions they want? I haven't seen that. But they agree that those are the issues. And that's kind of the nice thing about this race, that we are kind of all talking about the same issues as opposed to people saying, no, it's this, no, it's that. Um, and and I, it looks to me like the voters are there as well. We know that the campaigns have been in the field with research, trying to figure out where they stand, uh, trying to figure out what issues matter to voters. So the fact that they're all talking about those issues indicates they're getting polling back that says this is what people care about. And it's interesting that you said that five of the 13 candidates uh, seem to be fairly hard line against homelessness. M and, maybe at least, at, least, at least five. I'd have to review the tape to see just how many. The questions that we ask people are, would you forcibly clear the encampments? Would you forcibly arrest people if they refuse your offer of shelter and there's no grounds to take them in for detox or mental health treatment? So just basically, would you arrest people for camping? Would you arrest people for being homeless in a tent on the streets? And and at least five or six said yes to that. That was that's pretty striking. that's pretty striking. Yeah, that's pretty striking. Um, and it's very clear that there's a rush to that lane. Okay. Mm. 
So you got 13 candidates, there's going to be a couple lanes. There's going to be your super progressive lane. There's going to be kind of like the self-avowed centrist lane or kind of like the apolitical lane. Then there's going to be this, this hard line on homelessness and crime lane. The rapidity with which people are trying to pile into that hard line lane indicates to me that they think that there are available voters there and that that's where a significant percentage of Denverites are. We shall see. The other thing is all of them are crowding in saying some variation of, and I'm the only one telling you this. <laughs> like, it, it's almost comical. Like, like you hear that from Andy Rougeau, the Republican in the race. He was not in the debate. Uh, four people were not in the debate last night because they're not participating in the Fair Elections Fund, which is the uh, matching, the taxpayer matching this year. The debate was sponsored in conjunction with the Fair Elections Fund, and the 13 candidates participating had to be there last night as part of that. But anyway... Andy Rougeau is one of the people saying, I'm the only one saying I'm going to crack down on this. Trini Rodriguez, I'm the only one saying I'm going to crack down on this. Kwame Spearman, I'm the only one saying I'm going to crack down on this. In some way, it's comical. It's like, y'all can hear each other, right? I mean, like, yeah. you guys are in the same race. Like, so all of a sudden, though, you're going to have this crowded lane of five, six, seven candidates out of 17 total on the ballot who are hardliners on this issue. So does that vote get split up a little bit? You know what I mean? Mm, so... so I don't know. Those those are just my amateur observations. And again, no, unless somebody gets to 50 percent, we're going to a runoff, which is we're going to we're going to a runoff. We're going to a runoff. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're yeah we're we're going to a runoff. That's interesting because if a number of these candidates stay strong, they hold on to their bases. You know, imagine if you get a situation where seven people hold on to ten percent. Hmm. And then it's divided, decided by a couple hundred votes one way or the decided other. Decided by a couple hundred votes and. What we're looking at in that scenario, and you'd have to say it's probably likely at this point, is that when you go into a runoff, the vast majority of Denverites will have will have not voted for either person in the runoff. Hmm. Isn't that wild? That is wild. Isn't that wild? So, and huh. uh, so th that's something to kind of think about, which is not unusual in situations where you have a runoff. But the number, the percentage of people who didn't vote for somebody in the runoff could be really high this time. Like two thirds. It could be two thirds. So a big question is going to be what kind of allyships happen before that point mm. in the race, which candidates are friendly to each other, which candidates complement each other, signaling to their people, like, this is our tribe, these are our folks, and which candidates say, signal, I'm not with those folks. Because at some point, it is going to come down to a, a one-two split, and people are going to have to make a choice. This person, that person, or don't vote. Those are the only choices that you're going to get. So to watch these coalitions kind of preform is very interesting to me. You tend to see this in a lot of races where perceived front runners complement perceived back runners to kind of bring their people along, hmm. you know, and, and it's kind of, well, it's benevolent, you know, like I'm, I'm in the front of the race, I'll compliment you. What harm does it, does it do me? A little trickier now, because they might all be kind of lined up percentage wise. So you're complimenting her and she might be your biggest rival. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's a really interesting thing to watch. It's interesting because you said in our preview to this that I asked you specifically, do you see any front runners? You said, quote, no idea, correct? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, at this point, I mean, it's, again, it's very early. We just had our first debate. I could, I could, give, you a, I could give you a guess. I could give you a guess as to, as to who would poll higher than others. It doesn't strike me that any of them would poll significantly ahead of others. Mm. And there's a good chance that people are pretty well kind of sitting in a pack right now. And it'll be fascinating over the next month to see how these things kind of sort out. I think, I think um, you know, to, to paraphrase the Rick James thing, momentum is a hell of a drug. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think momentum could be interesting because there may be voters who want to be part of something that's headed to a runoff as opposed to a lost cause. So we'll see if some candidates start to get momentum and then people kind of pile in, resources pile in, volunteers pile in. Or maybe everybody just slogs it out down to this runoff and then figures it out at that point. You, you can talk to candidates or, or people around candidates in this race that basically are just like, head down, get our people, get our voters out, don't fight with the other candidates, just do our thing and try to cross the tape in first or second. Mm, and guess. then there's others that are out there and they're throwing bows and, you know. Yeah, so we're going to see a bit different match, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, approaches here. Uh, remind us, second and third debates, when they are. And yep. um, you also have interviews, by the way, with all 17 candidates coming up as well. Yes. Uh, so second debate is March 14th on 9 News. And then the third debate will be prior to the runoff. Uh, so that will be in May. 
and the interviews are coming up in the next couple of weeks with all the candidates. Three of them launched their campaigns on Next, so we've already heard from them. Mike Johnston, Leslie Harrod, and Chris Hansen. Um, so we've heard from them. We'll hear from the other 14, every single person who is on the ballot, and we'll have those interviews on uh, Next as well as on other programs here on 9 News. You'll be able to see them on 9 News Plus, and we'll have them on the Next YouTube channel as well. And you said it, Kyle. They'll be here on 9 News Plus as well. But, Kyle, thanks so much for taking a few minutes of your time to kind of recap of what sounded like a fascinating debate back on Thursday night. Always happy to join you in the glass case of emotion. <laughs> thanks, Kyle.